Late 19th century Anier likes to think of itself as a seaside resort. Boisterous crowds on the banks of the Seine gather to cheer on the regattas. The boating club is a place to be. The chateau, now a restaurant, much appreciated by the middle classes, echoes to the sounds of dances and gay soirees. Even prostitutes, declared undesirable by the prefect of Paris, have sought refuge in the town. On this Sunday of summer, 1883, the weather is hot and many Parisians take the train, the omnibus or tramway to Anières to enjoy the river. It is also where artist Georges Seurat is headed, sketchbook in hand, to observe the throng on the riverbank of this cheerful suburb. Week after week, back in his Paris studio in Rue Chabrol, Seurat uses the hastily sketched details to compose the large canvas entitled Bathing at Anières. What do we see? A snapshot of an ordinary Sunday with its swimmers and boaters. But the stylized frozen figures seem rigid, like ancient statues. Constructed according to classical rules, this ordinary scene seems to be vibrating intensely. Closer examination reveals a juxtaposition of colored strokes, making the picture unusually bright. The use of these colored strokes, later to become dots, is Seurat's great invention. But more of that later. For now, let's focus on the picture. What is it telling us? To find out, we must examine the elements on the canvas, its movements and postures. Uncover the picture's secrets and try to understand what it is telling us about a city, a country, an era, and an artist. Seurat has painted men and young boys swimming and enjoying themselves. Among them are simple walkers, low-level employees, and workers who have come to cool down on the banks of the Seine and enjoy the rural quiet. But why are they all looking in the same direction? Even the small russet dog in the foreground is on the alert, ready to bound off. Perhaps they are watching a regatta or a rowing race. Or maybe they are gazing into the distance across the river. Opposite is the Ile de la Grande Jatte, where walkers in their Sunday best are strolling and lolling in the shade of trees. Like them, Seurat is observing the island, eyes turned towards the subject of his next picture, a Sunday afternoon on the island of Grande Jatte, in which he will continue to develop the technique he has just discovered and is experimenting with in bathing at Anières. Both pictures share an immediately recognizable element, the boat flying a tricolor. But let's leave the upcoming Grand Jatte and return to Seurat and our swimmers. Posture of the figure suggests calmness and even a touch of nonchalance. But in the background of this bucolic, gentle scene is a great deal of bustle and activity. A train crosses a viaduct blocking the skyline. Black smoke pours from the factory chimneys. In this late 19th century, the suburbs have been transformed. The Industrial Revolution is in full flow. The times are changing. Just beyond the factories painted by Seurat, barely 10 kilometers away, Paris has been transformed. In just 20 years, the painter has seen the city change beyond all recognition. In the name of modernity, architect and town planner Georges Eugène Haussmann has built 26 boulevards, erected hundreds of identical buildings, increased the number of bridges, created new public buildings, and designed gardens and parks. Hygiene is in its hour of glory. The work of Pasteur is celebrated beneath the dome of the Institute. 
Monsieur Pasteur has shown that microscopic organisms spread throughout the atmosphere are responsible for fermentation, not the air, which in fact only transports them. The names of these organisms are very numerous and will have to be defined and in part discarded. The word microbe, which has the advantage of being shorter and carrying a more general meaning, and of having been approved by my illustrious friend, Monsieur Littré, the most competent linguist in France, is one we will adopt. Life expectancy is longer. The exodus to the countryside is growing as the population of the capital doubles. As a health measure, Prefect Poubelle introduces his famous trash cans. And the polluting factories are forced out beyond the gates of the city. The flip side of the coin is a grinding poverty of the industrial suburbs. Forced out to the edges of the city, workers are crammed into districts full of hovels and makeshift cabins. Small towns, now huge bedroom suburbs, are regarded as high-risk zones. A member of parliament describes them as follows. The barbarians threatening our society are neither in the Caucasus nor in the Tartary steppes. They are in our industrial suburbs. The bucolic Anier was not spared. In 1848, the bargemen set fire to the railway viaduct in protest against competition from the trains. In 1870, the bridges were burned down by the defenders of the city to delay the advance of the Prussian army. The station was destroyed by enemy fire. A year later, battle once again raged in Anier. The town fell into the hands of commune insurgents and it took the Commandant de la Place de Paris 10 days to take back the city. By the time Seurat is painting his picture, the bridges have been rebuilt, and the trains are running again. People come to Anier to relax, have fun in the water, and sleep on the grass. In the center of Suraz Candace, the young boy catches the eye. His back is stooped and his shoulders droop. A relaxed pose, or exhaustion. Maybe he works in the cliché gas plant we see behind him. It's possible. Apprenticeships begin early, at the age of 10. And the 12 hour days there are long. More and more workers are needed to keep the machines running. The drive for profitability has transformed workers into cogs in a chain of operations they no longer understand. In the new factories, the noise is unrelenting. Temperatures are high in summer and glacial in winter. There is an ever-present danger of parts falling, a belt snapping, or oil overheating. Coupeau, the blacksmith character in Zola's La Sommoire, works hard. On account of the dirt of the forge and of the monotony of constantly hammering on pieces of iron of a similar kind. Progress comes through technical and rationalist ideology. The French Scientific Management Organization fast becomes a model for industrial countries. It uses a detailed breakdown of labor, forcing workers, now mere cogs in an immense mechanized endeavor, to carry out carefully calculated time tasks. Rationalized, repetitive, scientific organization like the strokes and points of color on Surratt's canvas. 
Was the artist also embarking on a form of mechanized picture production? Let's take another look. In Bathing at Anières, Seurat, riding high at 24, was in the process of inventing a new technique. What exactly? Using a method known as optical painting, Seurat makes shapes appear and creates color contrasts without the need to mix colors beforehand on the palette. It achieves an effect akin to pixelization way ahead of its time. The calculation of proportions dictates the spacing of the tiny strokes such that the eye restores a natural view. Thus, a detail or piece of clothing that looks brown to the observer is actually a multitude of red, blue and yellow strokes on the canvas. In a letter addressed to a merchant named Durand Ruel, Camille Pessero, who went on to adopt Seurat's method, explains that it allows the artist to use an optical mixture instead of a mixture of pigments, because the optical mixture creates a much more intense brightness. And that is the technique we are talking about. Seurat put on canvas the precepts of Eugène Chevreau's book, The Principles of Harmony and the Contrast of Color. Chevreau was a brilliant physicist with the appearance of a mad scholar whose observations established that two colors placed side by side influence and change their environment. Complementary colors set side by side are intensified and when combined are destroyed. Seurat also drew inspiration from Root's contrast diagrams, which determine three fundamental contrasts. Contrast of shades, indicating complementary colors. Contrast of lines, that is, the distances in comparison with the horizontal. And contrast of tones, with which he experimented in a range of drawings. Critics like Félix Fénéon went on to speak in terms of divisionism, or even pointillism. The process strikes a blow at the notion of sensitivity usually associated with art. Seurat preferred to talk in terms of harmony. Art is harmony. Harmony is the analogy of contrasts, the analogy of similarities in tone, hue, and line considered through the dominant trait and under the influence of combinations of ebullient, calm, or sad illumination. Unlike the Impressionists, for whom all that matters is a motif driven by the feeling and emotion of the moment, Seurat composes his canvases scientifically in the studio from a set of sketches and observations. When working on bathing, Seurat goes to Anier to produce drawings and small paintings what he referred to as coqueton, his name for the oils and sketches he produces on site as an aide memoir. He pins them up on the wall of his studio and consults them while he works on his canvas. In all, there are 14 drafts in oil and 10 sketches. The artist gathers details in the course of his trips to Anier, keeping some and dispensing with others. Thus, the horses being washed in the Seine, which he had sketched, disappear from the final canvas. Some features are made up, with Seurat summoning a model to his studio for the man seen from the rear, crouching in the foreground. Bathing is a synthesis of scenes he has carefully studied, then selected. No one was more precise and meticulous than this very serious artist. A rather unsociable and uncommunicative apostle with the face of Christ, one of his old friends remarked about him. Another saw him as a good-looking boy, very sweet, sometimes sad, consumed by his art, tormented by the idea of improving his technique to make the finesse of his vision more tangible. The artist Albert dubois Pillet sang his praises. Sera, he led the way for me. I owe him everything. His sense of order and discipline made a deep and immediate impression on me. Through Seurat, and thanks to Seurat, 
I came to love painting. Meanwhile, author Maurice Beaubourg found him very worthy, modest, and straightforward. But his obsession with the need for science and chemistry and art, and their adequacy therein, quite flabbergasted me. Born in Paris in 1859 to a middle-class family, Seras soon showed a gift for drawing. A pupil in the fine arts, he was taken aback by the Impressionists when first confronted with the works of Pissarro, Degas, and Monet. He was 21 and, like them, wanted to find a new way of painting. He also appreciated the very classical allegoric frescoes of Puvis de Chavannes, whom he met several times. Bathing at Anières would be compared with Happy Land, one of the master's last pieces. A canvas displayed at the 1882 Salon, just as Seurat was starting work on bathing. With bathing, Seurat calculates each effect. He pulls us fully into this bucolic scene. Firstly, by the imposing size of the canvas, two meters by three, and then by putting in the foreground along the edge the man with his back to us lying in the grass. The boy sitting with his legs in the water is a center of attention. Strictly speaking, by the laws of perspective, the size of this central figure is slightly disproportionate in relation to the others. Slightly raised, the grassy embankment becomes an observation point. It divides the picture into two distinct parts, land and water. The pile of clothes lying on the grass catches the eye. White shirt, dark trousers, and straw hat. Sunday best for the day which has only recently become the official day off. The choice of which day workers should have off was the object of much political debate. Since the revolution, artisans and workers had their Saint Lundi, or Holy Monday, a legacy of the Enlightenment. But the middle classes and the Catholic Church refused to accept it, seeing Saint Lundi as an opportunity for workers to attend political meetings, indulge in debauchery, or go to cabarets. And so, on an ideological basis, the day of mass gradually became a day of rest. What does Surat think of all of this? He takes great care not to reveal his political affiliations. His picture is anchored in the reality of his time, but does not portray any social misery. However, like most avant-garde artists, he moves among journalists of the anarchist press who support the workers' struggle. Seurat is witnessing unprecedented change. He was born under a dictatorship and will die under a parliamentary republic. In his 30 short years, he experiences a war against Prussia and lives through the Paris Commune. He sees the rise of left-wing ideas and witnesses, among other things, the advent of press freedom, freedom of assembly, and the right to strike. But what do workers do on Sundays? They pray, stroll, play boule, or drink with friends. In Paris, they amble along the main avenues, the newly built shaded paths, but also through parks and along cafe terraces. Some like to grab something to eat on the grass or take a family walk. And then there are those who, as in Seurat's canvas, leave the city and head for the water to go swimming, boating, or fishing. In A Day in the Country, Maupassant writes, When they got to the bridge of Neuilly, Monsieur Dufour said, Here we are in the country at last. And at that signal, his wife had grown sentimental about the beauties of nature. The open-air cafes along the Seine are always teeming. People gather to enjoy a few drinks among friends, maybe have a meal, but most of all, to dance. 
Artists, men of letters and people of leisure like to mingle with the grisettes and the bad boys. The Sunday outing is an opportunity for workers, both men and women, to cast off their day-to-day -day work attire and don their smarter clothes. The poorest improve on their everyday dress with the help of a few accessories, a shawl, an embroidered apron, or maybe a straw hat. All kinds of hats are represented in Seurat's canvas. Straw hats, bowlers, felt cloche hats, top hats. As many types as there are different social classes mingling on the banks of the Seine. Clearly visible, placed on the grass close to the main figure, is a straw hat. They are tremendously fashionable in this period among bathers and water enthusiasts. Among them is a boater with a brim and flat crown adorned with a ribbon. Introduced by the first Parisians to venture onto the Seine, the boater is inspired by the regulation headgear of sailors and bargemen. It is a man's summer hat of choice. Celebrated by Renoir in his famous picture, Luncheon of the Boating Party. In its own way, bathing at Anières captures a life developing on the banks of the Seine. It is a fresco of its time. Fifty years earlier, the scene painted by Seurat did not exist. It took four hours to reach Anières in a calèche. City folk had no way of escaping to the country. After 1837, the journey was only 45 minutes from Saint-Lazare train station. By the time Seurat paints bathing, most of the rail network has been built and the middle distant suburbs are developing apace. Consequently, the distance between the home and the workplace can grow. The service to Anières is excellent, with up to 50 trains a day on Sundays in summer. It can also be reached by tram or omnibus from the Place de Clichy. Families squeeze onto the upper decks and outside platforms. Third-class travel amid all the noise and jostle. Seurat works on his canvas for over a year, but when he presents it to the 1884 jury of the Salon of Fine Arts, the verdict is unanimous. It is refused. It's not difficult to see why. What are they meant to make of a picture that is neither classical nor impressionist, much less symbolist? Not to mention the nascent pointillism. Seurat then joins other artists excluded from the Salon to set up the group of independent artists. They are allowed by the city to exhibit in a temporary building near the Tuileries. But being too big, bathing is relegated to the refreshment bar. Fortunately, it is noticed by critic Félix Fénillon, who recognizes the picture's originality. He sees in Seurat's systematic approach nothing less than, quote, a connection between the harmony of all the senses. One Belgian observer, a correspondent for an avant-garde art circle, remains rather perplexed. He is unsure whether Seurat is the messiah of a kind of new art or a cold hoaxer before finally opting for a sincere and thoughtful painter, an observer whom time shall judge. Félix Fénillon had already made up his mind. He defends the canvas and devotes many articles to Seurat. He diffuses the explosive criticism of pointillism, expounding and rationalizing scientific theories. He became the hero of this new movement, with Seurat at its center, later joined by Paul Signac and Camille Pissarro. Bathing in Anières, without question, marks the end of one era and the start of another, both by its subject and by its scientific technology. Seurat seems to have understood, long before other artists, that the present was veering towards the intriguing but ruthless religion of progress. He saw no reason for art not to be part of this upheaval. Thank you.